evening. Good to see you in the Lord's house this evening. Hope you've had a good afternoon. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. And um, it's just good. I, I was thinking as we sang that uh, that first song, I got thinking about the song, it gets sweeter, sweeter, sweeter as the days go by. It's just a joy to, to walk with the Lord, isn't it? Yes. Sure is. Um, I think a lot about what Sister Kathy says. All of us has heard her say it. I just don't see how people make it without him. Uh, he's so good to us. So good to us. It's a joy to, it's a joy to be a Christian. It's a joy to be a child of God. I'm glad that we've got hope beyond this life. We got hope while we're here. Not only hope beyond this life, but hope while we're here. And uh, so I'm thankful for that tonight. I uh, wonder if you got anything on your heart. Something you feel like you need to say or do. A testimony of some kind. The Lord's been good to you. You want to share it with somebody? Before we go further in the service tonight.
something on his heart he's going to share with us tonight. You pray for him. So tonight, I'm, uh, I, I, like Brother Clay said, I, I just I spoke to him earlier this morning after the service. I told him I had something on my heart, and I, I just uh, I told him whenever he's ready, I'm ready. And so he said, well, just come on tonight then. So I'm thankful for this opportunity. Uh, it's good to see everybody. I, I just want everybody to know I love them, uh, love the Lord. Uh, if you want to turn your Bibles... Uh, Chapter 4 of First John, I'm going to be reading, uh, i got several verses on my mind uh, to go to, but uh, this, this, the verse here, I'm on, it's where I'm going to start, so First John chapter 4 and verse 15, <laughs> and when you find your place, if you're able, and if you don't mind standing for the reading of the Word of God. <clears throat> Chapter 4 and verse 15. It says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Thank you for standing. If I had a, if I had a thought, if I had a, I don't know if you'd call it a title or whatever for tonight's message, it would be Opportunities. And I say opportunities, and you think about, sometimes you think about opportunities in life as, you know, maybe a job opportunity or a, a, a friendship opportunity, like Brother Mike was talking about, you, you encountering people that you, you come upon that, you know, you've never met before, but you get to talking to them, and before you know it, you've had an opportunity to make a new friendship, but... The opportunities that we have, uh, and you think about, you think about it like how many, how many of the sports figures in, you know, all the sports, you know, not just you know maybe the one you're familiar with or that you're interested in, but you figure, you know, if you're a golfer and uh, and you had the opportunity to go golfing and and get some pointers and some tips from uh, Tiger Woods or Phil Mickelson or one of the greats of golf, you know, and it was that opportunity was given to you that you just, you know, all you had to do was show up and all you had to do was just listen and learn and, and he would just take you and show you, you know, how to hold your hands for the correct grip, how to, how to swing the club perfectly in a line to where you, you hit the ball more true and, uh, or say you had the opportunity if you was into, you know, basketball to, to go and, you go to a Michael Jordan camp, and, and Michael Jordan would be there and teach you how to have the correct form to shoot the ball, or, or, uh, or any sport. You know, a tennis player to go and have one of the greats like Andre Agassi or Federer or what, to show you how to swing the tennis racket to where you're doing it in perfection of, you know, to where your your grips right, your your stance is right, everything's the way it should be for you to be better at it. How many of you would turn those opportunities down? You ladies, if, you, if you're into, maybe you, you're interested in watching some cooking show and you had the opportunity to go and, and be right there with one of your favorite cooks that you watch maybe on TV that, that teaches new methods or something, you know, some tricks or something to make a dish that you don't know how to make, you know, and, and, and you could be right there with them and them guide you with all of these things. How many would turn that down? How many would you, uh, how many would you think would, would say, ah, forget it, I'll sit at the house. I don't need that. I don't need that trip to the golf course with, with Tiger Woods. I, I don't need it. I'll just sit here. I don't think we would. And I'm talking about what you're interested in. See, I don't play golf. Now, I've hit some golf balls at a driving range, and I enjoyed that. But I don't play golf. I probably still wouldn't turn down a trip to the golf course with Tiger Woods. But my point being, if it's something that you were personally interested in, you wouldn't turn it down. You would be excited about it. You would be wanting more of it. You would be wanting, hey, let's go do this again. When it was all over with, you'd be saying, 
I wish, can we do this again next week? How many times do we have opportunities in life like that for us to be Christ-like? How many times does God put path, pathways in our way for us to be Christ-like? And I'm going to read some more verses. The next verse right after that, and I stopped for that reason, but the next verse says, And we know, we have, excuse me, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. Now, the, the verse prior to that was the one I read first. It says, Whosoever shall confess the Son of Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. So you hang on to that. And you say, And we have known and believe the love that God hath to us. So we believe that love. Because we already believe that God let His Son die for our sins. It says, God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. And God in Him. And that is the opportunity I want to talk about tonight. The opportunity of love. The opportunity of giving, giving all of you. And what I mean by the opportunities, if you go back to chapter 3 of 1 John there, and you read in verse 14, it says, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brethren abideth in death. So we have the opportunities given to us there. To show the love, the love that God has shown us. Yes. And if you read over in Galatians chapter 2, and verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. One of the favorite chapters of the whole Bible to me, and this, this is where I'm going to be going more tonight. And you can turn there. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But I'm going to read one more verse in Romans. You don't have to turn there. You can if you want to. I, it's... You're, you're, actually, it's more than one verse, but it's Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us he died for us when we were yet sinners the term being a Christian the term being a Christian and I screenshotted this because I liked it but you think that the word Christian it means to be Christ-like. The definition of Christ-like is a person who quali whose, qual ah, whose qualities like Jesus Christ, who has qualities like Jesus Christ. An example of Christ-likeness is kind, forgiving, sincere, caring, and, ex and accepting person. Resembling or showing the spirit of Jesus Christ. The opportunities. The opportunities we have in life to do these things. There's so many times that we are offered these opportunities in a path that God is taking us down. Brother Mike's done said he run into people at Cracker Barrel. Now, 
he could have, when the guy come up and spoke to him, he could have, you know, had kind of the cold shoulder and just acted like he didn't want to speak to the man. He could have, he could have been kind of rude about it and just thought, well, I'm here to eat. And I'm not really here to socialize. I don't know this man. I don't have to speak to this man. Just go his way. But yet we have opportunities. Opportunities to show that the love of Christ lives within us. That we believe that God gave His only Son to die on the cross, crucified, buried, raised from the dead for us, for our sins. And that's why I read the verse, for we know we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. Yeah. That's evidence. It's evidence in your life. When people see that you love the brethren, that's evidence mm -hmm. of Christ in your life. But yet, how many times is there a pathway? Like I said, God is taking you down. And you have that opportunity. And it's a choice for you. A choice for you to make. Right. And you can say, God, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this thing that you ask. But the when God gives us the, the opportunities, we have that opportunity a lot of times to die out to the fleshly thoughts, the thoughts of the things that seem right to us so that we can do the things that seem right to Him. Because the way of the man seemeth, that seemeth right to man is death. How many times has your pathway given you those opportunities? Your opportunity to come to church tonight, not only to come to church, but I say come to church with a changed heart. How many of you, when you were getting ready to come to church tonight, how many of you worried more about what you might wear? Worried more about how your hair might look? I wasn't worried about that. <laughs> but yet some might have been worried about where their heart was placed. When we enter in those doors, or in the doors of any other church, the revival, anywhere we might go, not just church, but God should live in our hearts. And we should be concerned when we come to church to have the heart of worship. We should come to church with the heart of praise and of that, put that garment of praise on. We should come to church with that opportunity given and take advantage of that opportunity. We shouldn't come to church just to be here to warm a pew. We shouldn't come to church just because Granny said you need to be there or Daddy said you're going to be there or... Uh, if I don't go, what people might think. Or if I'm sitting at the house and church is going on and somebody drives by and sees my truck in the, in the driveway, they're going to say, well, why is he not in church? That shouldn't be your reason for being here. Your reason for being here is because of the opportunity to worship. The opportunity for your heart to be filled to come to this altar when you need that cup filled up. When you need... How many times is the opportunity given with an altar call and you sit there in your seat or stand there at your, at your pew waiting for the song to be played and be over with and yet you don't move? The opportunities that we have to, to instruct our children that this is a place to worship. And, and draw from God and pray to God. We come down here as a church this morning, and I love that. I, Brother Clay, right before he spoke and said, look at what we got, look what we're doing here. I was sitting there thinking the same thing. This is wonderful. That our church comes down and we take advantage of the opportunity to come together, to come together and pray for one another in times of sickness, in times of hurting, in times of, of despair. 
those are the opportunities we take advantage of. And yet, J.W. just mentioned how wonderful it was at the revival. He took advantage of that opportunity to go and hear God's Word and hear the songs and hear the, the Word of God preached. But I want you to think about in your life how many opportunities you're given and how many you don't take. How many, how many trips to the golf course with that pro golfer are you leaving out, so to speak? We're talking about the man of God. We're talking about Jesus Christ here. Above all, He is everything. He is everything. He is love. God is love. How many times do we have the opportunity to show love, but yet we don't go there? And I said I'm going to be reading from some from chapter 13 in uh, 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> and I'm going to go there now. I want to stop and go there now. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, and have not charity. Now I want to stop right there. And I want you to, every time I say charity, I want you to plug in love in your minds. Because this word charity here does not mean charity as in giving alms, of giving like, like the charity we think of in this day and time. This is a different charity. This, is, this word virtually is, could just be replaced with love because this is what it's talking about. But it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I am become as sounding brass or tinkling cymbals. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. Do you realize what nothing means? Nothing is nothing. And I heard an old preacher say one time he had a, he had a truck that would, it, it smoked so bad it was like he was pulling a brush fire. It was so junky. That's all he could afford. And he needed tires for it. And he pulled in. He didn't want to buy brand new tires. Didn't know how long the truck would even run. And he pulled in and he said, I need some junk tires. And the man running this junkyard said, Sir, we don't sell junk here. We sell opportunity. Because that tire you're talking about putting on that vehicle is opportunity. Opportunity for you to go on down the road a little further. It's not junk because junk is worthless. It is nothing. It's good for nothing. It has no purpose anymore. But Paul writes here that with all of these things, with faith, with with faith to move mountains. With faith that strong. I'm talking about faith that's a faith we don't even have an inkling of. We don't even we can't even start to think about how the faith he's talking about here. He's talking about faith that removes any obstacle in your way. Anything. There is no sickness. There is no no death. There is no, no nothing that can stand in your way with the faith he's talking about here. He's taking faith to that high of a level. But yet he says, if you have this kind of faith without love, you are nothing. Nothing. And he started out speak, talking about speaking with the tongues of men and angels. Is it possible for a man to learn and know and speak every tongue of every language throughout the world? And you ask, well, how many is that? How many, how many languages are there? A couple hundred? Oh, no. A man asked me that one day at work. We were talking about this. I said, because his son speaks several languages. His son is a, a uh, special forces. He's worked in, uh, he's went actually through embassy training, which is even higher than special forces. And he's stationed in all countries around the world. He has to not only speak that language, he has to speak it fluently and with enough accent that they believe it's who, that he's from there. <clears throat> but he only knows a few languages. And we were speaking about this one day. About, I said, could you imagine the gift? Could you imagine the gift of God could just... And you knew 
you every language. Every tongue, every language. There wouldn't be a man that you couldn't walk up to in any part of the world, any tribe in the middle of the Amazon. I mean, think about that. Places where modern day man would be killed to walk into because those people have never seen any. I mean, I'm talking about those, those languages that we haven't even touched, maybe. But to be able to walk into any of those places, to go into any country, and to walk up and speak to any man, woman, or child in their language fluently, with no hesitation, have that gift. We were speaking on that, and he said, Well, there's got to be at least a couple hundred languages. Oh, no, there's thousands. Thousands. But Paul writes here, if you had those that ability, if you had that ability to do that, how you might think you were something. But yet you would be nothing without the love of God. Nothing. And he goes on and he says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. And you think, how could a man give all of his belongings to the poor? How could he give his body to be burned and not be showing love? Oh yes, there are men. There are men, there are women that do service only for their glory. And you know it and I know it. There's men that will stand in pulpits because they want to puff their chest and look at me. God forbid. God forbid that any of us have that attitude that we're something. But you know well as I do, that service of... How many, how many times that people might give something and they do it make, making sure that someone sees... Look at this offering I'm giving to this charity. Never in their hearts was there any love. It was all about, look at me, what I've done. And Paul says here, without the love of God, you are nothing. You can bestow all of your goods, not just some, but you could give it all, and you'd still be nothing without the love of God. Love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemingly. Seeketh not its own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Now that's a whole lot. That's a whole lot. When you start thinking about it seeketh not its own. It's not puffed up. Like I just said, some, some men will do things just to, to puff their chest up, to look at me, look at what I've accomplished, look at what I've done. Seeking their own, seeking their own glory, seeking their own well-doings and their own well-beings. But yet Paul says, without love you're nothing. Thinketh no evil. Now you imagine that. That person that's done you wrong. That person that's, that's hurt you or maybe done something to you. And you say, well that old boy just needs his jaw slapped. How many times you heard that? You know you have. I've heard it. I've said it. I'm not lying. Somebody do somebody wrong. You know right from wrong, and you see it, and you say, that ain't right. They ought to be punished. He ought to have his, he ought to have his tail, you know, put in a sling. He ought to, be, he ought to have his jaw slapped. Paul says here that it love thinketh no evil. Boy, now that gets down to the heart of man right there. Because I tell you, you can be a really good man and have a hard time dealing with that. Hard time dealing with that. Verse 6, Rejoice, Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. 
beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. Love never faileth. There's a hope that we have. A hope we have in Jesus Christ. In the love that he's shown us. And that hope can, that we can bestow, that, that opportunity. And I'm talking about opportunities tonight. That opportunity of hope that you can give somebody else. It beareth all things. Because love beareth all things. Scripture just says it. And you say, what do you mean, preacher? You know, there's times in your life that you may come upon a time when you have to bear something. You have to bear a debt that you don't owe. You have to bear a burden that isn't yours. You have to bear a heartache that you don't deserve. God love us. It's an opportunity. So how many times you think in your life that we sit back and we have that opportunity and boy, we don't consider it an opportunity. We don't think of it as an opportunity when we're having to bear all things when we're having to bear the things that God has sent our way to draw us to him to increase our faith in him there's a lot of times we don't see it coming from God I spoke a little bit Friday night after Kagan and Vanessa and Vincent sang, they sang a song about the evidence. And I talked about how a lot of times people see a man or woman or maybe co-workers, you know, whoever, they see God blessing that person in riches, in health, in their children's health their children's accomplishments, their, their family's accomplishments, their, you know, they're not in need for anything. They, they just, you can't help but just say, well, more God's just blessing that person to the full. Look at all that God's doing for that person. They must be living right. How many times when we are bearing all things, how many times do we really look at those blessings that God's really giving us when we're bearing that bad news of cancer when we're bearing that bad news of a sick grandchild or child when we're bearing that bad news of losing your job all the things that life throws your way I'll tell you folks that evidence though we none of us would beg for it and say well Lord send it my way I'll tell you right now that evidence to me is way more evidence than seeing somebody driving a nicer vehicle or seeing how, how much better off you think they are I'll tell you because when you get to that point where you can't and you say, what do you mean when you can't? I'm talking about when you get to that low point. When you get to that, this burden is more than my shoulders can bear. More than my soul can bear. I am in a pit. I am in a dark place. I am in a spot that no one can get me out of. And I'm, when you get to that point, when you get to that point of, 
There is no hope for this sickness. The doctor has given me no hope. When there is no hope for this because I don't have enough money to fix it, it wouldn't matter if I had a million dollars. If God doesn't put a lot of us in that place a lot of times, I believe, we wouldn't know how to trust Him. Because of our, if our strength was what we were depending on. And I spoke about how in Judges chapter 7, I believe it is, in Gideon, he's, he's, he's told to, to downsize his army. He's told that you got too many. And, then, and I had to go back and read some of it on it after Friday, or after, yeah, Friday night, because the numbers had slipped my mind. How many? It was 32,000 he started out with. And God said it's too many. But yet, it already, they were already on the mountain and they could look down and see the Midianites' armies was so strong. There's so many, they said it was as grasshoppers of the field. It had to be overwhelming. It had to be something that was unbearable. It had to be. But yet, God give him another opportunity. God give him an opportunity to not only win the battle, but he said, you got too many. And he tells them, everybody that's faint of heart, everybody that's scared, y'all just go home. And over two-thirds of them, 20,000 it says, left. So that left him with 12,000 men, and God said, no, you still got too many. Now, they didn't have enough to start with. They're looking at the mountain. The armies are so vast, and you could, it's uncountable. So they don't say it's grasshoppers. Now, if you've ever seen a plague of grasshoppers, and I haven't seen one personally, but I've seen them on, on videos of National Geographic. So you think of the numbers like that's what they're comparing this to. It was unbearable. He said, you have too many. And then he, of course, instructs them how they drink the water when they, when they kneel down or when they lap it up. like, And he gets them down to 300. Yeah. 300. Boy, don't you know, Gideon's sitting there thinking, well, you just keep making opportunities, don't you? But God had done said that if, if I don't do it this way, if, if I... If, 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 if I don't let, if I allow you to do it with these men, Israel might rise up and say and vaunteth theirself and say that they did this under their own strength, that they won this thing under their own strength. And that's why I say God gets you down sometimes, I believe. See, we ain't having to fight a valley full of Midianites. We're not having to look down off of a mountain as, as a an army of men that's as thick as grasshoppers. We don't have that opportunity, but I tell you right now, we have a lot of opportunities come our way in our lives where God can strengthen us spiritually through the battles that we have. But all these things, all these unbearable things, I'm closing. I could keep going on in chapter 13 there. I love the whole chapter. But I really want you to just I really want you to just think tonight. I want you to think of how unbearable how unbearable that opportunity is sometimes. And I'm getting away from the sickness thing now. I'm talking about your opportunity to be Christ-like. Your opportunity when God says, when God says to you, that ain't the way I'd do this. That's not the way I'd handle this situation. But yet it seems right to you. How many of us are going to take that opportunity? 
How many of us are going to take the opportunity to come to church with the open heart before we ever even leave the house, before we step through those doors? How many of us are going to take the opportunity to come into this building and be the church? Be the church that God would have, have us to be. And being Christ-like by showing love and by living the life that God would have us to live. Filling these pews with love. The love that you bring a heart of worship. That when you show up, you say, God, I'm here and I'm yours. Lord, you just have your will and way right now. And we say that a lot of times, but how many times do we mean it? Have your will and way right now, God. I want you to, I want you to have that heart tonight and the next night and the next night and the next night because that's where God wants us to be. He wants us to take advantage of that opportunity. He wants us to take advantage of the opportunity to have that kind of heart. But yet so many times we don't. Dan, you come y'all come with a verse of song. Just think about that tonight. Think about how, how many times you've been given that opportunity. Maybe it's tonight. Maybe you you came and didn't think about the opportunity that you had tonight to be here. How wonderful it is. Not just to be with, with fellow Christians in a church in a nice you know, we got our air conditioning blowing and going. I mean, that's nice. But the true opportunity has nothing to do with the building. The true opportunity has nothing to do with how comfortable the seats are. The true opportunity has to do with what we're here for and just worshiping God and letting God just flow through our hearts. Let Him come in and take those burdens that you feel like are unbearable let him take them off of you let him just strengthen you in all aspects this altar is full of so much opportunity but yet so neglected it was, ta it was preached and talked about in the revival this past week about the furniture of the church and how the pews or the furniture how they're used and how the pianos and the, and the, the pulpit and the organs how they're used and all the furniture of the church, how, how much it's used and how little the, pull, the, the altar's used. Take the opportunity to set examples. How many times has God pushed it upon your heart and then said, and knocked and said, and you said, well, well God, I'm not sick. I'm not, there's, I, don't really, I don't know of anything I really got a burden on to, to go down there to the altar. But God's knocking and you're still standing there. And it's because maybe God's putting that in your heart, that, that knock on your heart of saying, you just go on down there and pray. Because there's another man standing over there that won't go unless, there's another, unless somebody's already down there. He don't want to be first. He don't want to be by himself. Maybe he's not from our church. Maybe he's, not, maybe he's just a shy person. Maybe he, she's just a shy person. And God's knocking on your heart to open that blessing up for them. And you stand there, or you sit there, and don't move. And you've not only robbed yourself of the blessing, but them. And that all revolves and goes back to that heart of worship. You can't quench the Spirit and have the heart of worship. You can't have that love of God in your heart and stand there and quench the Spirit. You got to allow the God to move. You got to allow Him to move in you. When He says, "Give a testimony," you can't just sit there, because it might be that person sitting across the church from you that's struggling with a battle, struggling with a with a hurting heart that just they've came and they're so far down in that pit they don't know where else to turn and they're so scared to say a word to anybody, they can't talk to nobody about it because it's something that's so personal. But yet your testimony might hit right at home with them and God's got it on your heart and you sit there. Don't dare do that. Don't dare. Don't ever dare think that, that God can't work through you. 
from the little to the big. That, that, that young lady that stood up and, and spoke the other night after I did children's church, and he was talking about her son and how he is a little fella. I don't know how old he is. I didn't see him. I don't, I don't remember seeing him, but she said he'd, at their church, he'd, he'd hit that altar all the time. He'd go down the altar, and, she, and, and people would ask her, well, what's he going down there for? Does he know what that's for? Does he, know, does, does he have an understanding of what, what he's doing? Go, why is he going down there praying with folks? He's just a little kid. And she said, start bothering her. She told him, don't, you, she, you say, don't go. You, she held him back a little bit. And that young man had to turn to her and he said, when God says to move, you move. Boy, I about shouted when she said that. Because out of mouth of babes sometimes, right? Sometimes we're ignorant and stupid. Sometimes we're, and I'm not calling her that, I'm saying sometimes we do things that aren't right according to God's will. We're not in the center of God's will. We're not thinking straight. And that young man had to tell her, and as soon as he said it, she said, Boy, you're right, Go. This altar is for everybody. This church should be for everybody. When you prepare yourself to come, you, you may say, well, I need to put on my best of my best. And button my shirt right, iron my shirt right, and get this right, and get that right, and comb my hair right. And, but I'll tell you right now, God sees you as who you are in your heart. He sees the depths of your heart. And if you don't think that he... If you're talking about the same God I'm talking about, he's the one that created all things. The whole universe. Those molecules that make your body, he made them. What would make you dare think he don't know your heart? Every inkling of it. He sees. And that's why I, I preach tonight on the opportunity of love. The opportunity of getting our hearts right before we come. Getting our hearts right while we're sitting here. Getting our hearts right to, it, to just take in this opportunity. Take in the opportunity to, to use the altar. Take in the opportunity to go give somebody... A hug, give them a, you know, share the love of friendship, share the love of, I mean, just let the love flow all over us. So that when people walk into the doors, they ain't even got to be spoke to yet before they go, man, this place is full of love. I can just feel it. You ever been in one of them places? I have. It's like, man, boy, these folks love one another. Go ahead, Jim. 125.
they're ministering and virtually what the whole concept behind the thing is the chosen it's, it's, it starts out the episodes if you go back to uh, it's, it's a season it's like a, a show like a, it's like short movies about Jesus Christ's life here on, on earth and but it's the chosen the reason they call it the chosen is it's kind of focusing on the ones he chose and, and the people that surrounded him Mary Magdalene, the disciples, you know, and it starts out introducing you to those kind of those characters, and 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 it points out a lot of things and perspectives that you may have never thought about, and it, it's very good. That's what I'm saying. Uh, so if you get a chance, just watch episode one. Just sit down and watch episode one. I guarantee you'll be hooked. You'll be saying, "All right, let's click to the next one. Let's click to the next one." But it, I mean, it, it is. It's very good. Uh, and on Wednesday nights, uh, Aunt Sneta and I and Heath, we're going to start a, it, they actually have a book, devotional, and everything that goes along with it, and so you can bring the kids, and you can watch the episode, and then we can discuss, you know, because if, if, you know, if most everybody in here is seasoned in their Bible, and they've been to Sunday school their life, or they've been to, you know, they've been to... Bible school when there's a kid they've, you, you've heard and you've read stories you've heard a lot of preaching over your life so you know a lot of the word of God and as you watch these this, they've they've did their best to stick to the word of God and so you'll see a lot of things that traditional uh, things that they would do on the Sabbath traditional I mean it's but they they've they've done their homework and they it's very good, but uh, I've watched the episodes a lot of times, multiple times because I watched every one of them by myself at first, and they touched my heart so much that I was like, okay, my you know, my kids are gonna sit down and watch this if I have to tie them down, but after they watched it, they were like, oh, this is they 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 really enjoyed it, and that was kind of my my way of seeing, okay. If we do this on Wednesday night, what? How are the kids going to respond? I believe the kids are going to respond well. Uh, so yeah, Wednesday night we're going to do the start that. And like Clay, y'all's kids, it's it's for anybody that wants to sit still and watch the the, the ain't it. And hey, I believe it'll be good. Uh, it throws up a lot of questions. You know, my kids sitting there, they would ask questions, and I'd have to pause it and go, just you know, you know, because. They're asking questions about well stuff that's right here that they're trying they're they're like sponges wanting to absorb it and that's why I say it's such a good thing because it does have a lot that they can learn <coughs> by seeing it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm sorry. ticker yeah. well at the top they have a ticker of views and it's millions of views and it's just it's just ticking and you scroll down to the bottom and it says and it's got like a little bar there of season or episode you know four of season three funded and it's showing it you know where people are donating and it's showing how much and when it gets funded a hundred percent it'll scroll by and episode five funded and it'll show the percentage and it's like he said, it's an ongoing thing. They're, they're taking these funds and they're putting them strictly into funding the next episodes, the next seasons. And uh, yeah, it, it, I, I sit and just wait for the next episode to come out now because I'm like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you've had that TV show maybe that you was hooked on. And you're like, man, it's like a series of, but this is this is the Bible. This is and it, and like I said. When you can see, and it was talked about on the radio also, like Mike said, I heard him talking about it on the radio, and I heard him talking about it on a podcast with uh, the Duck Dynasty guys, their Unashamed podcast, and they were talking about when you can see the 
characters kind of come to life a little bit, it brings up things in your mind that you might not have. And that's what I was talk, referencing to earlier about the things you don't think about. The perspective these men or women was probably in, like, you know, the day and time they were in, the, the things they were going in. I believe if, if you if you give it a shot and, and watch it and look at it, you'll, you'll enjoy it. I, I, when I find something like that that I enjoy, you know, and I, I it's sharing the Word of God, believe me, I wouldn't want to hold it back from you because it's like a gift, I promise you. If you, if you get into it, it's, it's good. 